Welcome back. So glad to see everybody here today for this conference. My name is Kate Dalton Boyer. I was uh, one of the founding writers here at FPR, which has been a great pleasure now for a long time. And I come here from Kentucky. And I was uh, reminded by something Paul Kingsnorth said last night and a question he answered uh, very well, uh, how fortunate I am to be rooted there. I am um, one of the lucky ones. It's my inheritance, not my achievement. And um, I'm grateful for it, as I am grateful for this group. Today, uh, we've got a panel on technology. And I'm going to introduce everybody at once and then let them, let them rip. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them kind of in reverse order in which they'll be speaking. Um, Tessa Carmen uh, comes to us from Maryland. And uh, both she and Cassandra are people I only know from what I have read. I'm meeting them here today with you. Um, but what I would say, uh, the way I can characterize her work is she writes as a faithful person figuring out how to go about her work in this world. And I think you will enjoy what she has to say here today. Cassandra Nelson is affiliated with the University of Virginia, but actually lives here in Wisconsin. So we have a local, a local person here today, which is wonderful. Um, one of the things I enjoy about her work is she has a very strong emphasis. It's clearly important to her to, to be an, uh, in the academic world and yet writing clearly. She writes, she is, she is a very clear, um, very clear writer, and that kind of clarity is a type of honesty, or is a manifestation of honesty, really. And we can all do with more of that in the world we live in today. So I look forward to her talk as well. Jeff, I know. And uh, the one thing I'll say about Jeff, because you can read all their bios in your program, I don't need to repeat that, but Jeff does a lot of work, as I think many of us know, on the FPR website and also for the magazine Local Culture, for which he never gets enough thanks and certainly never gets enough remuneration. So if you speak to him today, please say thank you. And uh, with no further ado then, I will, we will start with Jeff and um, welcome again to this panel. Take care. Well, it's a treat uh, after anticipating this gathering for so long to, to be here. And uh, so thank you, Kate, and uh, looking forward to our conversations today. There's never enough time at FPR conferences to talk to all the people who I want to talk with, right? So we don't get to share a long conversation. I'm sorry. What sunt nu thus formerin thus wisan goldsmithes bon weolandes? I had to uh, talk to my colleague, Jack Baker, my former colleague, Jack Baker. Let me brush off my grad school Anglo-Saxon so I could read that line, probably badly. Uh, and it forms the epigraph to the third novel in Paul Kingsnorth's Buckmaster trilogy. The line comes from, and this is kind of weird, but it comes from Alfred the Great's translation of the classic book of medieval Christendom, which is Boethius, Consolations. And the translation uh, that Alfred does or has commissioned or whoever does it, it's not, not clear. Uh, it's a little fast and loose. He wouldn't, wouldn't pass muster today because he replaces the Roman general Fabricius, uh, who I guess you figures his Anglo-Saxon, his British audience won't know, replaces it with this uh, guy, Wayland the Smith, a figure that his, that his readers would be more familiar with. And here's the longer passage from Consolations, from Alfred's Consolations, but rendered back into English uh, for us. Uh, where she reminds Boethius that all worldly fame and wealth is fleeting. Where now are the bones of that famous and wise goldsmith Wayland? I call him wise, for the man of skill can never lose his cunning, and it can no more be deprived of it than the sun may be moved from his station. Where are now Wayland's bones, or who knoweth now where they are? So we'll return to this reminder of the transience of all human aspirations to power. But that Alexandra begins with a quote from Wayland about Wayland is no surprise. Right? One way of reading the Buckmaster trilogy is as an extended meditation on this Wayland myth, which is a very disturbing story. And the last novel in particular, so I'm not going to go into the other two um, for the sake of time, but the last novel in particular invites us to consider how this old Norse myth might reveal something about the nature and dangers of AI, of ChatGPT. 
my current obsession. Uh, I'm not going to offer a traditional reading of the novel, though, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, in part because I'm going to just from the get go bracket the conclusion. And I'm doing this for two reasons. One, I must admit that I feel, still find the ending of the novel not quite satisfying. Uh, I told Paul I was going to say this. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the fault is in the novel or in the reader. So I tell my students, usually it's in the reader. Um, but I'm emboldened to admit this, uh, despite Paul's presence here, because several years ago, Jack and I uh, gave a talk at an FBR conference where Wendell and Tanya were, were present. Wendell was giving the keynote. And we began by disagreeing with Wendell. We said that, uh, we said, you know, Mr. Barry says the university is a hopeless institution, but we work there. We still have hope here. Uh, and he came up afterwards, graciously thanked us for our talk, and later gave us the uh, foreword for the book that developed from that talk. So quibbling with the conference keynote has worked out really well for me in the past. <laughs> and uh, given what I know of Paul's generosity, I think I can do it again. But this brings me to my second and really more pertinent reason for not just offering a, a straight up reading of the novel, because I want to use the novel in a sense to kind of reflect on the pervasive temptations and threats of AI. And to do so well, I think this novel reminds us that we need to recover a better story about who we are as humans and what our responsibilities are to one another. So the tale of Wayland Smith and then Paul's novelistic reflection on this point the way toward maybe a better story, one that might help us recognize the fundamental temptations of AI, and then imagine uh, the proper response to those temptations. So I'm going to give a brief background in case you're not up on your Norse myth. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the two temptations of powerful technologies like AI, ease and justice. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the consequences these stories suggest uh, that, that ensue when we succumb, and then think about three ways uh, of responding. But in brief, the Norse myth goes like this. This guy Wayland and his two brothers live in a forest called Mirkwood, right, because obviously Tolkien is deeply influenced by these stories. Uh, and one day three swan maidens fly in, marry the three brothers, all is great. And then eight years later, the three swan maidens leave. They fly home for uh, obscure reasons, but they leave the brothers quite distraught. Two of them go in search of their brides, Wayland works at his forge, making gold rings and other things for his beloved, while faithfully waiting for her return. There's no shit of patience uh, in his practice, his craft. When this king, King Nidud, hears that Wayland is alone, maybe vulnerable, he sends soldiers to capture him. They bring him in chains, cut his knee sinews so he cannot run away, and imprison him on an island where he is then forced to make whatever the king desires. One day, the king's two boys come to visit him, they see some of his gold, his gems, they're really entranced. And Waylon says, I'll, I'll show you more treasures if you come back in secret. So they do. He kills them. He turns their skull. this is gross, sorry. He turns their skulls into goblets, their eyes into gems, and their teeth into this brooch. And then he gives the goblets to the king, the gems to the queen, and the brooch to their, uh, the brother's sister, the princess. Without, you know, there's no, but they don't know the origin of these lovely objects. <laughs> then uh, the princess is also wearing this ring that the king has stolen from uh, Wayland. She breaks the ring. It's not quite clear how. She comes to Wayland in secret, wants him to fix the ring for her, apparently without her father's knowledge. He instead rapes her, uh, then dons his kind of swan wings that he's crafted, flies away, and as he's flying away, he tells the king, by the way, uh, this is what you've been drinking from. You can find your son's bones here, and uh, this is whom, whose child your daughter is pregnant with. Yeah, it's a gruesome tale. And it carries a grave warning that if you coerce another to do your bidding, to make you rich and powerful, then you may experience dreadful consequences. In particular, your children may suffer for your hunger, for ease and prosperity. And while clearly computers are not persons, relying on robots, a word right, that literally means slave, to bring us ease and prosperity might still deform us and our children. And of course, as a good myth does, it has many other warnings. You know, if I was talking about uh, the first novel in the trilogy, The Wake, I would emphasize um, the way this myth suggests that those who oppose greedy technocrats run the risk of becoming as dehumanized as the people they oppose, right? It's maybe one of the great um, reflections of the, of the first novel. But the, the last one, uh, in particular, helps us see these dynamics about AI, I think. 
Uh, in an interview I did with Paul a couple of years ago uh, for the FPR website, we, we talked about this a little bit, and he told me he wasn't quite sure where the figure of Wayland comes, came from as he was working on the series. He said, uh, Wayland emerged as a character in my first novel, Almost Unbidden. I didn't plan for that to happen, but it always took over in the writing, and he's appeared in all my fiction since. In some ways, he is the very essence of an ancient, dark strain of the English imagination. It gets apt, but it's, it's a darkness that we still have to look at head on. So Alexandria, the novel, how does this reflect on the myth? Alexandria is set in a distant future, maybe a thousand years from now-ish. Uh, human civilization has collapsed after humans degraded the world and made it uninhabitable. And apparently in the last ditch effort to save civilization, or perhaps in an effort to avoid the real work required to live differently, humans created an artificial intelligence called Wayland to take over the civilization now known as Alexandria and to preserve the world's dwindling resources. But it's not at all clear what they have in fact created. And, and Paul actually alluded to this last night, and I think in the Q&A time about, you know, sometimes, um, these technologies might be a portal you know, for things that their creators did not intend. But by the time the novel takes place, most humans have ascended into some disembodied state of existence hosted by this AI, this Wayland, and, and the earth has slowly recovered from um, the ravages of civilization. A few humans remain in these small remnant communities and they're holding out against Wayland's tempting offer to free them from the challenges and sorrows of embodied primitive life. The father of this order characterizes Wayland as the latest iteration of the primordial temptation. Wayland was made by people to build Alexandria. We made him so we could live forever. Oldest dream to be gods. The character K is a retainer. He's this kind of artificial human whom Wayland has, uses to persuade the few remaining people left leave their bodies behind. And Kay comes to these victims in, in moments of weakness, isolation, and then tempts them. And his proposition is always twofold, that ascending to Wayland's grid will provide ease and justice. As the order's mother summarizes Kay's temptation, he offers escape from grief, from pain. Right? I mean, life is hard for this community. Uh, and so Kay puts it this way when he's tempting one human. He says, if your life on earth is going to be a hard scrabble in dying soil or a struggle to survive in a lawless megacity slum, why continue in it any longer? I think we all get that with the offer of chat GPT or AI, right? It's easy. It's maybe obvious. But more subtly, Kay also figures Wayland's offer as, as the path of necessary relinquishment. It's a sort of virtuous act. Human bodies were destroying the earth through their insatiable appetites. Hence, apparently, the only way to save the ecosystem is for these persons to give up their bodies, shift their consciousness to some kind of less energy intensive medium. So Wayland is always promising to restore balance to the cosmos, to eliminate suffering and violence, to bring about a rational order. Violence, he claims, is bred into your flesh. And the only way to eliminate injustice and violence and suffering is to liberate humans from their bodies. So I think, uh, again, these are the two temptations that ChatGPT and its attendant technologies poses. The promise of ease, alleviation of suffering. You know, you don't have to write emails or plan menus or form business plans or craft arguments. You just plug your prompt into the machine and it will spit out custom tailored ideas and prose. As someone who's graded this prose, it's not really prose, but anyway. You can offload the difficult work required to relate well to other people and to the world. But the promise of justice is quite present in these um, technocratic temptations as well. Uh, and it serves a key role in, in rationalizing their adoption, right? Sal Khan, founder of Khan Academy, has launched Khan Migo, an AI tutor. And he calls this the biggest positive transformation that education has ever seen. Clearly, he's selling a product. Now, every student on this planet can have an artificially intelligent but amazing personal tutor. He says this levels the playing field, right? And enables children from all backgrounds to access a great education. Khan claims it can divine what is possibly the misconception in that student's mind and then ask them questions to help them figure out, right, and learn. Uh, venture capitalist Mark Andresen, who was mentioned last night, this is not from his recent um, essay, but from something earlier. 
He has said that he dreams of a day when every child will have an AI tutor, every scientist and CEO will have an AI collaborator, and every person will have an AI assistant, coach, mentor, trainer, advisor, therapist. So you all get your individual amigo, right? This is going to be amazing. Latent in this promise of a personalized virtual friend is the erosion of our fundamental human capacity for presence. And we see this in the original Norse myth. King Naidu's children are killed or raped. The people he thought he was building an empire for are taken away or damaged. Given the loneliness, anxiety, depression, and educational struggles of children today, a similar bargain seems to have been made with our digital servants. And I just want to briefly name three of the particular ways, I think, that relying on AI to give us ease, prosperity, and justice actually causes us to forego the very activities that might enable us to be present with one another. The first is simply that AI replaces the work that forms us. Right? As humans, you must struggle and suffer in order to develop one's capacities. An athlete, right, we get this in athletics, has to break down muscle fibers in order to build strength. A musician has to play a difficult passage over and over again in order to gain the freedom to then play that song effortlessly and beautifully. A writer has to wrestle with ideas and words in order to understand and articulate some facet of truth. And when we outsource that productive effort, we become weak, helpless, shallow. In the Norse myth, Wayland's mode of waiting for his bride is to make something beautiful. Right? He devotes himself to this craft. And he sees, I think, the cultivation of art as one means of inhabiting what George Steiner calls the immensity of waiting. That is the human condition. Of course, this comes in that famous, I think, uh, section at the end of Real Presences. Really profound book. Uh, but, but then Wayland's craft is interrupted and misdirected when Nidud kidnaps him. And Nidud, of course, has no interest in the difficult work may uh, require to actually master the, the craft of forging or making beautiful things himself, right? He just wants to um, co-opt Wayland's work. So both are harmed by Nidud's search for a way to bypass the productive work that develops their own potential. Uh, on this, I'll just uh, footnote, you know, if you've read Need to Be Whole by Wendell Berry, he talks at great length about the damages that happen when um, certain kinds of tasks are offloaded to different classes and both both those who make others slaves and those who are enslaved suffer as a result. AI then, second, so first it replaces the work. Second, uh, it replaces the dependencies that constitute us. And apparently, if you listen to the boosters, we should be glad to depend on AI instead of a teacher, a pastor, or a mentor. But if we do, we will then be formed by our relationships to a computer rather than our relationships to persons. Um, the, the boosters would tell us that AI makes us autonomous, but as Wendell Berry reminds us, there is in practice no such thing as autonomy. Practically, there is only a distinction between responsible and irresponsible dependence. A dependence forms community. There is no community without need, without dependence. And you see this in Alexandria, I think quite perceptively, in that those who are part of this remnant human order that exists, that resists uh, Wayland, they each have very distinct roles to play in the community. It's very rigid, um, and, and these roles are demanding. They restrict individuals' freedom to do what they want. But insofar as these members uh, fulfill their responsibilities and care for the order, they cultivate rich, meaningful relationships. Right? They, they don't have an identity crisis because they know what their role is in that community. On the contrary, when we pursue autonomy, we end up like King Nidud, who is horribly lonely with a slew of damaged bodies in his wake. And then third, AI replaces those voices that would convocate us. So if you rely on a machine to think and speak for you, you will come to think and speak like a machine. As Barry writes in one of his poems, each one who speaks, speaks as a convocation. We live as councils of ghosts. The voices that we attend to populate our minds and shape the categories by which we imagine and then act in the world. When we convocate machine-mixed, shallow verbiage, we become hollow, shallow persons, unable to be truly present to ourselves or others. Alan Jacobs makes a similar point by way of a passage from Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow. One of the characters in that novel defines what he calls temporal bandwidth. Temporal bandwidth is the width of your present, your now. The more you dwell in the past and the future, the thicker your bandwidth. 
the more solid your persona, but the narrower your sense of now, the more tenuous you are. It may get to where you're having trouble remembering what you were doing five minutes ago. So Jacob says that reading old books, breaking bread with the dead, in Auden's phrase, uh, is one way to respond to this problem. But I think it's anything that we can do to listen to and internalize and be in conversation to depend upon wise voices thickens our souls. It enables us to be present. In Alexandria, as, as Wayland is failing, the AI is failing, um, the father tells Kay, you know, uh, this retainer, that you know nothing. All you knew was given by Wayland, and now that he does not speak, you are empty. You are not even sure of your words now. So as Wayland goes silent, the grid fails. K cannot eat, live, pray. He is some strange, thin body cut loose to float. Similarly, people who outsource work and thinking and words to a machine cannot be present to another person. Their very self, their very being, or essa, right? The, the root word of present, to be, to have being in the face of another, uh, is, is uh, atrophied when you outsource these, these activities. Uh, as you know, if you've talked to somebody who spends too much time in front of a glass screen, You've experienced this, right? You cannot have a conversation with such a person because their mind is a set of memes and hashtags and sound bites. They have no real being to put in front of you. And it's a very sad experience. In Alexandria, the power of, of, of such embodies, so on, on the contrary, the power of successfully you know, vital presence appears at key junctions in the novel. Perhaps most notably, when Kay tempts one of the very last humans, one of the three or four last humans to join Wayland, she responds not by arguing with him or angrily fighting him off. Rather, she offers this sort of semi-deformed human the gift of her presence. She puts her hand up to his face and touches him. Later, when he stumbles into one of their snares, set for an animal, she frees him and comforts him again. Her persistent offer of compassion and presence finally enables Kay to see her as a person, right? to imagine her, maybe in Jason's um, formulation as a, as a person rather than a target, right? an objective to, uh, to get to uh, ascend. And it is no accident that this character's name is a derivation of Sophia. She is a kind of lady wisdom. And eventually, uh, Kay finally accepts the comfort of human touch and presence and turns away from his machine master to join uh, the humans who remain. So I think this old Norse myth and uh, Paul King's Norse novelistic reflections on it suggest that rather than grasping for the power, the ring, right, that would magically bring about ease and prosperity and justice, our task remains the same as it has always been, to become people who are capable of thick and redemptive presence, and then offer this presence to those who have become strange, thin bodies cut loose to float. Right? We can, no matter how powerful AI seems to become, we can never underestimate the authentic power of true presence. And if this call to become people capable of offering genuine presence to others, particularly others hollowed out because they've succumbed to the lure of the gizmos, seems radically incommensurate with the damaged world that we inhabit, the growing power of AI and the machine, I would just conclude with two reminders. The first is that the biblical book which most acutely articulates the anguished cry of injustice, does not pose some sort of rational answer to the problem, but responds simply with presence. When Job cries out to God, God does not give him some technique or some tool to magically bring about his friend's version of rationalistic justice. Rather, God offers Job his presence. And this may seem an unsatisfactory response to the gravity of the suffering and the injustice that Job experiences, or that Kay articulates, or even that Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor articulates. But God's presence to Job, and then of course, um, the fulfillment of that in Christ's incarnation, where Christ takes on human flesh and presence, is the biblical response to the problem of suffering and injustice. And Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky gets it right then, when Alyosha doesn't refute his brother Ivan's questions he kisses him. Second, remember ladies, Lady Philosophy's question that I began with. Where now are Wayland's bones? Right? At the end, all of the machines that we build, all of the systems that we put our trust in, no matter how powerful or cunning they seem, 
no matter how inevitable they appear, will perish and turn to dust. By the novel's end, among much that remains uncertain, it is clear that Wayland has collapsed and that Kay has joined the humans whom he once tempted to give up their bodies. So too, our embodied souls, the souls that we form through the work we engage in, the people we depend upon, and the voices we listen to, will endure long after the silicon chips, the power AI, are crushed and forgotten. So may our souls be capable of presence. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here and thank you, Jeff, for inviting me to be here too. The title of my paper in the printed program is From the Golden Mean to Median Humans. I left out a subtitle because of peer pressure. Uh, nobody else had one on the draft program, so I was afraid I might look overly pedantic and boring if I crossed that line, although thank you, Kate, for saying I'm not that kind of academic. Um, but the, the secret imaginary subtitle that I've been carrying around in my mind for the last couple of weeks is From the Golden Mean to Median Humans, Technology and the Sinking Middle. The sinking middle is a phrase, or rather an image, that a colleague of mine, Tony Domestico, an English professor at SUNY Purchase, coined earlier this year. I saw him at a conference this summer and at a seminar that was basically about pedagogy during slash after COVID, whichever one we're in now, um, I said that I felt like Rip Van Winkle. I last stood in front of a classroom in June of 2018. And from what I hear, things have changed a bit since then. So I was trying to gauge from my peers what the realities on the ground were like now in English classrooms. And Tony's summary of current trends, sorry, I just finished this, I'm looking down more than I would like to, but Tony's summary of current trends was, quote, the bright students are still bright, the struggling ones are still struggling, but the middle is sinking. And I thought that was a really good image and one that did shine some light onto current pedagogical conditions. It does feel like the middle is sinking, both in classroom settings and beyond, or maybe like it's hollowing out or disappearing or something, depending on the context. The middle is arguably sinking in education. It's hollowing out in terms of individual character development and linguistic and emotional depth. It's almost like we planned it, but we didn't. Um, and it's disappearing completely in politics. The hollowing out is what I'll focus on the most today. And I, I suspect it's the root cause of the sinking in performance and, and learning and all the other stuff. And of course, there's nothing that I can see today that a good poet couldn't see coming 100 years ago. So words from W.B. Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, came to mind. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. In the next 15 minutes or so, my hope is to understand the process by which we might have arrived at this strange situation with respect to middles. I don't know if what we're seeing is mere anarchy, or if there are perhaps a few observable rules. On the one hand, we as a society seem to be heading toward increasingly rigid and vitriolic extremes, I'm thinking again of politics here. On the other hand, we're also hurtling, evidently unstoppably, and for some of us even quite eagerly, toward a different and completely new kind of middle, one that might look more or less okay at first glance, but that any deeper inspection reveals to be highly problematic. And of course, that is the kind of middle generated by artificial intelligence, which for all its marketing hype is really just, as I understand it, an averaging machine, it takes the middle and moves us more to the middle, an averaging machine writ stupidly large. For the sake of not giving the last word over to despair, I also wanna switch around the first part of my paper title now too. We're actually gonna start with the idea of median humans, a phrase that OpenAI founder Sam Altman has used to describe precisely what his company wishes to make obsolete. Then we'll wind back, unfortunately, very briefly to Aristotle's golden mean so that we can conclude on a somewhat hopeful note. My working premise here is that one, computers are by virtue of their very nature bad at existing in or navigating the middle as a concept. Again, I'm not a computer scientist, but as I understand it, computers understand only zero or one, off or on, I guess, or off. 
nothing in between. Two, human beings are, by virtue of their very nature, good at middles. We are, I would argue, a remarkable mix of physics and metaphysics, of dust and breath, the middle, the space in between, good and evil, heaven and hell, anything you can think of. That's where we've always existed. Three, when we ask computers to navigate the middle for us, they do a crap job. Four, again what Jeff was saying, when we become so malformed by our tools that we ourselves begin to think like computers, we human beings also do a crap job of navigating the middle. All right, there we go, let's begin. First, let's look at the drawbacks of the median human approach. The term median human here indicates a being whose abilities are evidently indistinguishable from what chat GPT and other generative AI companies can produce. And what can they produce? As I understand it, generative AI works by inputting massive amounts of data, unconscionable amounts of water, and eye-popping amounts of electricity. It takes all those inputs and then magically and laboriously, even more laboriously perhaps than the proverbial room full of monkeys taking all eternity to type up a Shakespeare play, uses them to spit out the most computationally likely text outputs. These outputs constitute an impressive linguistic chimera that combines bland and boring pablum with sometimes fantastic and sometimes subtle and insidious lies. The AI business is taken to calling these untruths hallucinations, which if Silicon Valley's rumored fondness for ayahuasca is true, they might not actually mean as an insult. <laughs> but it is an insult, both the lies and the pablum to our human intelligence and human nature. AI hallucinations are basically always present in the output of generative AI, and they're present despite the work of various human actors along the way who double check the machines quote unquote learning. You don't hear much about them from Sam Altman, but you can read a, large, a long article in Vox online about the independent contractors who are paid a pittance on very short notice in order to say identify images of knees and elbows over and over for 36 hours for a few dollars a day in Kenya. There are more horror stories in Malaysia and you get into the content moderation, it's just worse and worse. But even with these supposed safeguards in place to counter machine error, a phrase you also don't hear very much about from Sam Altman, chat GPT hallucinates. Early efforts to see what chat GPT is capable of. I haven't used it, I, I have friends who've they send me stuff and I don't have students, but I, again, I just hear say the, the horror stories. But, but from what I read in the, on the newspapers, uh, early efforts to see what ChatGPT can do have shown that it can't be trusted to serve as a paralegal or as a marriage counselor or as an oncologist. <laughs> right, why did, I can't believe we even had to check it, but yeah. In one study run by Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Researchers tried to see if ChatGPT could be used to develop cancer treatments. The answer was yes and no, and therefore no. <laughs> Thank you. Inappropriate, inappropriate treatment options were intermingled with correct ones, writes Kylie Lapara for Bloomberg News, quoting one researcher who said that ChatGPT, quote, speaks oftentimes in a very sure way that seems to make sense, and the way that it can mix incorrect and correct information is potentially dangerous. It's hard even for an expert to identify which is the incorrect recommendation, end quote. ChatGPT's baseline output of lies, in that study at least, was about 12%. When you remove what little, or perhaps what lot, it's just secret, remains of the human element from generative AI, by feeding AI-generated data back into the system rather than pilfering new data from books, images, and music created by actual human beings, things get even worse. They get much worse. Within five iterations of a machine eating its own waste products, outputs disintegrate from hallucinations into madness. Another group of researchers, this time at Rice University in Stanford, has named this phenomenon model, model autophagy disorder, or MAD, MAD. Writing for Tom's Hardware, Francisco Pires explains that, and I'm going to quote him a lot because I don't know this stuff technically, training an LLM, a large language model, on its own or another's outputs, creates a convergence effect on the, effect, on the data that composes the LLM itself. Successive training iterations 
lead the model to gradually yet dramatically lose access to the data contained at the extremities, the outliers, the less common elements. Pyrrhus continues rather poetically, and I quote, as the name implies, the model essentially eats itself, <laughs> not unlike the Ouroboros of myth. It loses information on the tails, the extremes of the original data distribution, and starts outputting results that are more aligned with the mean representation of data, much like the snake devouring its own tail. What struck me the most when I first encountered the term model autophagy disorder isn't what it tells us about computers or AI, so much as what it tells us about contemporary culture. How many Spider-Man movies have been produced in my lifetime? How many in yours? How many more are still to come before we each die? I'm, I'm joking, and it, like, it's so absurd, you have to laugh. Ditto Batman and Superman and now Barbie and whatever else is in the pipeline. Model autophagy disorder also seems to explain, this will only make sense if you're my age, why every reality TV show, and I haven't really watched any in about a decade, but I used to be a big fan, gradually becomes a highly stylized but also pale and insipid version of itself. If you're around my age, which is 40, and you had access to MTV as a teenager, you may have first experienced this phenomenon with real world. That's the seven strangers picked to live in a house to have their life tape, see what happens, and just you know, start getting real. I don't remember the specifics, but I'd guess that five iterations of real world, with each coming, incoming generation of strangers presumably having watched the season before, was about all it took to eliminate the outliers. Everyone got more telegenic, but somehow less interesting. And I still have a strange soft spot in my heart. Again, sorry, this is only for like whatever percentage of the crowd. For some of the oddballs who made it through casting in the early days, like Elka, Montana, even Puck. If, like if you know what I'm talking about, you're like, they would never be on TV now. So one thing that gets driven out right away when human beings attempt to emulate a computer's approach to middles is idiosyncrasy. I'd argue that this is where we can start to make sense of the hollowing out process. Many people today seem a little empty somehow. Even entire institutions seem a little hollow these days. I recently published an essay where I shared my theory of, uh, it's not scientific, it's anecdotal, of the mysterious thing that resembles learning but is not. There's also a mysterious thing that resembles work but is not. I think it's behind all the articles on burnout and one like a mysterious thing that resembles parenting, but is not, and one that resembles governing, like you name it, we'll find the hollow imitation of it today. What unites all of these phenomena is the terrible drive, like this terrible drive right now to standardize everything, to put the needs of an algorithm above the needs of flesh and blood made in the image of God, human beings in a room. Whether it's school assessment data for K-12 institutions, U.S. News and World Report rankings for colleges, OERs for army officers, you name it, everybody in charge today has somehow got a PowerPoint or an Excel spreadsheet that they have to answer to, but somehow they rarely or never have to answer directly to the faces of those supposedly in their care. I don't envy them, these contemporary leaders, when I remember Christ's words in the Gospel of Matthew. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father. Another thing that makes Sam Allman's phrasing so creepy is that the median is less affected by outliers than the mean. Again, the median is less affected by outliers than the mean. You throw a couple of really exceptional values into a data set and they're gonna show up in the mean, they're gonna shift the average but they're not gonna show up as much in the median. So I think Sam Altman is sort of subtly and not necessarily consciously rooting for a future in which exceptional human beings don't interrupt the status quo of median humans. Thankfully, I don't think that humanity works the way Sam Altman wants it to. I have even less formal training in theology than I do in statistics, but I'm vaguely familiar with the Catholic idea of spiritual currency. In meteorology, they have what they call the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings in one place and a hurricane appears in another location. The spiritual economy, as I understand it, is at least as vast and as sensitive as atmospheric weather patterns. One mass is said, one prayer is uttered, one soul is brought back to life through the sacrament of reconciliation, 
And the effects of that single act by a particular individual can be as wide ranging and as world encompassing as the flapping of a butterfly's wings. If you aren't Catholic, you could think of the image of the leaven in the lump. There's like two leavens in the lump in, in the New Testament. It was like really bad and one's like really good. I'm thinking of the really good one. One or two faithful people, we are told, through the miracles of persuasion and authority and grace can spread goodness to many. So although Sam Altman might, might want us to do away with outliers, I would suggest outliers are actually the only thing standing between us and madness, both the model autophagy kind and also just like general insanity. Man cannot live on bread alone, and man also cannot live on the median of all that has been said and thought before. There needs to be some kind of newness and renewal. The most consistent source of renewal in the world and beyond it, I would argue, is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, Pentecost accepted, only communicates to one person at a time through conscience. Children are also a pretty good source of renewal. For a while now, I've had an uneasy feeling that our societal love of generative AI is directly related to our lack of love for children. Right, yeah, like you see it too. Thank you. We're in the right, we're in the right space. I have a daughter who's four years old. Right now she's at a birthday party to bowling alley. She'll be running around later today looking for friendly faces to tell about the birthday bowling party thing that she went to. Um, and my daughter, it's occurred to me lately, is arguably a kind of large language model. For roughly five years, if we count the time she had ears but wasn't yet born, I've inputted English language data into her data set. Although, unlike a computer LLM, my daughter isn't comprised solely of data. She has memory and language, yes, but also a body. She consumes much less electricity and water than a computer LLM. She also takes in and gives back and gives back what a computer does not love. And whereas ChatGPT can generate words but not sense, my daughter is always made sense, even well before she could speak to me in words. When she makes an error, it is generally intelligible. I'm sorry, there's probably a better example, but this is all I could think of when I was writing this late at night. Lately, Fancy Nancy has set her off on a search for exotic words, and Evelyn, my daughter, asked one day if there's a fancy word for toot. Please no one say F-A-R-T. She hasn't heard it. I don't want to hear it. Don't say it if you, if you meet her this afternoon. So I said, yes, flatulence. I flatulenced, she immediately replied. <laughs> Again, what she said isn't quite right, but it's clear that she understands what she's saying far more than ChatGPT understands the cancer treatments it's so confidently cranking out. A lot of the toys marketed at kids her age right now drive me nuts because they all say interactive. But what they really mean is buy this and you won't have to interact with your kids. Well, poo poo, I say, I like interacting with my child. Like she and I can sing the ABC song, we can count. Like we don't need a creepy pre-recorded voice to do it for us. Again, like the, you know, other word for two, like I just have to also keep in mind what will keep me sane as a mom. And that's, but that's the most terrifying part of the sinking or disappearing or scrambled or hollow middle to me these days. So many people seem to have lost confidence in their own ability to handle complexity, nuance, gray spaces. So many people seem to want to be told what to do, to have their inner lives emptied out. Whereas I think that the beauty and the terror of, say, Aristotelian virtue or God's grace is that nobody's going to tell you what to do. You won't be left completely unaided. Everyone needs to be taught and supported and accompanied. But the soul that learns to govern itself is a soul that can no longer fall into the rigidity of a strict binary or a set algorithm. I've run out of time to really get into the golden mean, but it's almost like the opposite of Tesla's self-driving car. Instead of switching over to autopilot and staring at your phone in the back seat, I picture this dashboard or thing that has all, you know, with all these possible virtues on it. And every single virtue is like a level that has to be carefully balanced so you can get the air bubble in between the two lines or whatever. Courage, for instance, is located between the extremes of fear, cowardice, and brashness, overconfidence. And where courage falls in any given moment 
depends on the particularities of the individual involved and the circumstances in which they find themselves. You never get to turn off your will and intellect if you want to live a life of virtue. And I would say thanks be to God for that. It's, it's fun to be alive. Like, even if you can remind the kids, it's fun uh, to think. Carlo Acutis, who's known as the patron saint of the internet, was fond of saying during his short lifetime, we are all born originals, but many of us die as photocopies. I guess that the best that I can hope for my daughter and for everyone else, especially young people today, is a prayer offered by a father and a Don DeLillo novel, I'm a big DeLillo fan, that's essentially a benediction against having his daughter turned into a photocopy. She's lined up to participate in a Mooney, you know, mass wedding ceremony. And at the eerie sight, he tries to remind himself, quote, who she is. Healthy, intelligent, 21, serious-sided, possessed of a selfness, a teeming soul. Nuance and shadow, grids of pinpoint, singularities that they will never drill out of her, or so he hopes and prays. Okay, does this work? Okay. There we go. Thank you to Jeff and everyone for having me. I uh, first heard about Front Porch Republic from my debate coach in college, Katie Tubel, and she brought some friends and uh, me to the first conference back in 2011, uh, including a uh, uh, fellow who, um, or yeah, one uh, of my fellow classmates came with as well, and he is now my husband, and he's here um, here today. So, so thank you. I don't know if that you know it probably helped to go to the Front Porch Public Conference. <laughs> uh, so, so who knows, everyone, what <laughs> the future. So, uh, my title: The Joy of Tech Resistance. Uh, or of machine resistance, uh, it could also be titled, of course, uh, is a nod to Wendell Berry's essay, The Joy of Sales Resistance. Um, and basically what I want to impart with you guys today are a couple of things that are summed up in that title. One, you don't have to buy what they're selling. You don't have to. You are free. And it's more fun anyway. But we'll talk about how, how to party well. But first, here's an, a different vision. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. This is the machine world. And this is, of course, from Wendell Berry's manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. How many times has Wendell Berry mentioned? It's, has anyone keep track? Dystopia is here to greater and lesser degrees in our world today. And there are also greater and lesser sanctuaries from dystopia where more human ways of being continue. Many a fictional dystopian world that we could name, including uh, in Heiko Gaskowski's new novel, Exogenesis, uh, Lantua, where drones surveil everywhere, where, where people ratchet up social credit points, where virtual reality is part and parcel of uh, uh, primary education, where people are tracked with chips inserted into their skin, where body birthing is banned and words like mother and father and parent are obsolete, and wherein Amish-like outliers to the world of Lantua 
are forcibly sterilized to keep their numbers down. These sorts of worlds are hardly different from many parts of our own. When we speak of tech resistance, it's not resistance to tools or technology in general we're thinking about. In our home, we love technology. We have two typewriters. We have lots of fountain pens. Alas, we have no eight track player. The really good one that my parents had was, yeah, lost. Um, but maybe we'll find one again. Uh, yeah, we got some beautiful fountain pens and my kids are already so spoiled using their seven, seven and five and well, the 10 month old is not, not allowed yet. Um, not even, not even pencils, but it, it'll, we love pencils too. We love, what else do we love? I mean, my family, you know, uh, I could tell you stories about my uh, aunt and uncle who their, their getaway car for their, uh, or vehicle for their wedding was a log skitter. <laughs> Top that, huh? We love tools. But when we talk about resistance to technology, which, yes, is a really sloppy term, but usually we understand what we mean by technology is not just a tool. It's the regime of technique, the totalizing control of the machine, the world that would prefer humans become more like machines in order to be more controllable. And the human being is madding, maddeningly resistant to being controlled, being systematized, but not immune. We can be cowed, we can be fit into little boxes, and we lose part of our humanity thereby. But you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to wait until you have $30,000 in savings and an $80,000 salary to get married and have kids. You don't have to go to the latest Marvel monotony. You can read a play with friends instead, throw in some props and costumes. You don't have to go to the club and jive to rhythmic algorithms. You can put the furniture out on the front lawn and have a hoe down in your living room. You don't have to get your son a smartphone. You can give him a pocket knife instead. You can build more like the elves instead of like Saruman. But it sure feels lonely sometimes. When John Seymour, author of The Self-Sufficient Life and How to Live It, and maestro of forgotten arts and crafts, advocate of the farmer and housewife, neared the end of his life, he hit upon this insight. You can't be self-sufficient on your own. I can't snap. You got to snap for me. Shucks. You can't farm on your own. What goes for farms goes for families, it goes for persons, it goes for the church. You are not meant to be alone. But in order to do this work of joyful living as a person, to be more of a person, we need to find people to be persons with. And they can be really hard to find, but they are there. I'm partially here as a witness that they're there because I found some of them. Uh, my husband and I have been, I suppose, unintentionally weird in many ways, um, including, uh, I don't know, I've never owned a smartphone, uh, which is not, does not seem that amazing to me, but sometimes I realize, oh, huh, well, still don't need it. I'd, it's okay, I'm okay. Uh, and when we got married, my husband, who was one of the few people that I knew at the time who had an iPhone, uh, turned in his phone when we got married and got a, a dumb phone and had some trouble convincing the lady, the store, that, no, I, a dumb phone. No, no, yeah, I know, I know I can get an upgrade, but it's not, I just want a dumb phone. So well and good. We found other friends who were kind of similarly weird. We would have, you know, and we'd gather together and have poetry nights and Anglo-Saxon club and, you know, just, you know, we're just strange people. But then you have kids. And then you really need to find the other strange people. Because <laughs> it's hard to be strange by yourself when you're surrounded by, or too often, you see people giving 
their precious persons a device that is meant to shut down their personhood intentionally because they are better able to be controlled. You can have some quiet, maybe. I don't think it's worth it. When we moved to the DC area, I started talking to a new friend, pontificating a little bit. I said, we should have more dancing. People should get together and just, you know, have folk dancing, just do those human things and not, you know, plan too much ahead of time. Just like go, go and dance. My friend said, well, how do you feel about technology? Oh, that's right, you have a flip phone. Okay, anyway, so I can tell you this. So there's this group of families that uh, have made this pledge that we will not give our kids smartphones or social media. We will have just low tech uh, commitments as a family. And we will pursue traditional ways of being human together, like folk dancing. It's coming up this Tuesday or Saturday night, you wanna come? And so we went and we found them. There they were, they were Scottish dance, you know, folk dancing. So the, they call this pledge the Postman Pledge. And if you've been reading from Port Republic, you've probably seen uh, uh, Matt interviewed the, one of the founders, Dr. Jean Schindler, who, uh, with her, with her husband, she, she thought, I want to limit uh, these sorts of influences in our children's lives. But we know what peer pressure is like. We know what parent pressure is like. How to find those other people who are also doing something similar. And so she spearheaded this, uh, this group of families. And I'll, I'll, it's, it's very short, the actual pledge itself. Um, as Christian parents, we recognize that everything God created is good and that we have the great privilege of teaching our children to know, love, and serve him in the good world he created. We also recognize that technological developments in the culture undermine our capacity to inhabit the world and engage in social life as richly or fully as we ought. Therefore, we pledge for the next year not to allow our children to have smartphones or use, use social media. We also pledge to conscientiously limit our family's use of electronic technologies in general and to cultivate the habits of attention and presence that allow us to grow in love of one another and of God. Knowing that we were created for deep bonds of community, we pledge finally to foster friendships among our families in the natural, traditional ways human cultures have always done. So the Post and Pledge folks get together and learn Scottish dancing. Uh, we get together and have a picnic, play field games, uh, sing carols by Lantern Light. Uh, we didn't make it the last time they did that. Um, and I try to tell everyone I know about this group because there are people out there who are willing to do this, not only to set limits as a family, but to pursue the good with joy. And this is what I would add. This is a good test. Are you partying? Are you having more fun than your children are? Are you showing them a rich and joy-filled life? Are you having over friends and guffawing over Shakespeare or having a play reading of, I don't know, Wendell Berry's The Bringer of Water, which is beautiful? Are you dancing into the night as late as you can? Now I have to get to bed earlier than, uh, than others do. Are we showing them a world where, yes, this is what it means to be human? Are we filled with poetry and music and song and dance and good food and meals? If we are not joy filled and if we're anxious, right, it's easy to be anxious about the worlds our kids are growing up in. Well, then they'll be anxious. They'll see you being anxious. 
it starts with us. Parents especially have an absolutely huge responsibility here and an opportunity. It is so much more fun to go to dances with your kids. It is so fun to take them to first things lectures. <laughs> they were a lot quieter than the cell phone that went off during the talk, I'll just say. Just bring Tintin tin comics in there. Just. It's so much more fun to involve your kids. We have birthday parties that start early in the afternoon. We have music and uh, celebrations, and then the kids go to bed and we keep going. We have the campfire on and the wine being poured. But what if you're looking for those people? You can't do it alone, but sometimes you have to. But sometimes you're not as alone as you think. You can invite people in to sing folk songs together. To ho you can host a play reading or a dance or a blacksmith blacksmithing party. I visited a friend who has a forge in his backyard and he lives in the Twin Cities. Yeah, go, go, go do these things, you guys. Parents have a huge responsibility here. But not just parents, because we're all persons and we're all responsible for each other. And some of us are grandparents, we're about to be grandparents. What an opportunity we have to build real living relationships with children, with our grandchildren, and other, but other people's children. Instead of, uh, you know, hiring someone to, to teach your kid a, a you know, class on whittling, say, maybe, maybe his grandfather can do that. What can you teach? What can you pass on? You all have something. And there are people there hungry for it. Absolutely hungry for it. Robert Troyer was an Austrian Jewish uh, immigrant to America. Uh, he ended up in northern Minnesota eventually after moving here and there and uh, he was had a lot of anger um, in him, rightly so. He, he escaped the Nazis um, in Austria and just uh, his um, family went through horrors. But when he moved to northern Minnesota, he looked at his children and, and asked himself, I've always been against something. And what am I for? What am I giving my children? And he planted a tree farm. That's one thing he did. We need to start with an understanding of creation as good and with an understanding of the human person as far more fascinating and mysterious than we give it credit for. Uh, Charlotte Mason, the wonderful British educator, she Takes this, takes this language from, from uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ and saying, do not despise the children by treating them as less than what they are. Do not treat them as machines. Treat them as persons. And do not abandon your post. So what are some ideas? I want to throw out a few ideas for us uh, as I near the end here, um, of what can we do? Because that is the question, isn't it? We can cultivate healthy imaginations, as already, has already been said. We can name the things, we can, and purify, purify the language of the tribe, as it were, right? Why do we call, you know, artificial intelligence intelligence? Someone think of a better term. Why should we use that term? In uh, the dystopian novel I mentioned earlier, the, the phone-like devices are called omnis. It's a little more accurate than, it's not a telephone. Personal computer, pocket-sized personal computer is a little more, you know, a mouthful. 
Well, let's learn to name things well and to think clearly and not be afraid of the term Luddite. For instance, it's that everyone, everyone says, I'm not a Luddite, but I mean, I mean, if you haven't smashed a smartphone recently, you probably aren't, I'm sorry, but um, I have not yet, you know, I'm not yet done that. So I do not have the honor of calling myself that yet. Apprentice your children and apprentice yourself to masters. We don't need more experts as much as we need more practitioners. We need masters to learn from. We need tradition lived out and passed on. We need knowledge in our hands. My grandmother was a farmer's wife, mother of seven kids. She taught herself to play the pump organ at home on her own from books. She'd later be often on the piano and organ, accompanying music at church. She learned to play the cello and started taking viola lessons when I was in high school. Keep growing. Trade instead of buy whenever you can. This I've stolen from Tanya Berry. Use the internet as scaffolding, not a substitute. I stole that from Alistair Roberts. Make your home a place of making. And be careful of ignoring what God has given you right in front of you. Who is there to have a relationship in front of you? What is the beauty in front of you? There's so much, so much more good than bad as depressed as I can get about the state of the world. There's so much more beauty, and it is stronger. A couple weeks ago, I uh, gathered with some family in northern Minnesota, and we had, um, we gathered and did, uh, there's a farm up there that my father grew up on. It's taken over by my uncle now. And every time we go up there, we take part in the farm work. And then we party really hard. So share work, but also share play. Those things ground us. Find something common to love. Maybe work first and then play afterward. We had a, a pig roast after a, a day of work and a barn dance. And we did party hard. The kids, Virginia Reel, swing dancing. So have more fun than your kids, but order your loves as well and ask what kind of world do you want to live in and are you building that kind of world? And always go back to the person. Here is, oh, and one other thing, make better technology. Make better tools. The wise phone is okay. I, will, I like push buttons, but that's me. But make more beautiful things. My dad used to say, life is a series of trade-offs, and it frustrated me to no end, but it's true. When you commit to one thing that takes away from something else, So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing, take all that you have and be poor. Expect the end of the world. Laugh, laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful though you have considered all the facts. As soon as the generals and the politicos and the artificial intelligence can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. You only practice resistance in order to practice resurrection. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers so much. We do have a little time for questions. The mic is there. 
you want to gird up your loins of social courage and come up and we'll, we'll do as many as we can. Hey, Peace. Uh, my name is Will Lyon. Thank you all. Um, I have a question that relates a little bit to each of your talks, but um, Cassandra, you mentioned uh, just in passing that people are looking to be told what to do. It reminded me of uh, Andy Crouch's book that came out last year where he talks about machine environments um, being kind of opposed to human freedom and spiritedness. Um, he uses the interstate as an example. You wouldn't be able to walk on the interstate. It's a machine environment. Um, and it got um, relates to what um, Jeff and Tessa were talking about in terms of um, instead connecting with reality and this idea of um, these other types of ways of being told what to do that aren't a machine environment, but more like tools that you master. And it got me thinking about when sometimes these topics are brought up or when people were complaining about the metaverse when it was coming out a few years ago. Um, people critical of it were being accused of reality privilege. And I guess how do we, um, you know, make this accessible to people so that we can have that combination of what you were talking about as a sanctuary, but also um, avoiding inequalities where, you know, you have this privilege of living a life that is more practicing presence and then people that are more subject to the machine are stuck there and it's kind of a, a drift there. Thank you. How many people in this room? I haven't I haven't gotten to be like a long maternity leave. So I haven't gotten to say this in a while. How many people believe in free will? That's better than anybody the last time I played that game in spring 2018. Like nobody believed in free will that I asked just. So I think you're right that there's this huge erosion of freedom and sense of our ability to do these things. That are the facts, but be joy. Like, it, yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> it's really objectively bad. Like, it's, it's a hard time to have children. It's a hard time, whatever. But there's this long quote that's like, "This is the best time ever to be everything." The only way I know how to do it is like go through the world joyful, even though everything sucks and everybody's gloomy. Like, and the you know, I think Dan Picker, like the English worry about this little corner. Don't do that. Like that's what worked for me was across people who move through the world with purpose. They seem to get a whole lot done in the day. They they didn't really complain. If they complained, it was a joke. And those were you know like once a colleague of mine at West Point back from a meeting with the department head and he was like man like they trust us so much here not in terms of quality but in terms of quantity. He got some new thing dumped on him, but that was his. I think like if you walk around and you're awake and alive, not frowning, even though there's a lot of reasons you could, that's all I can think to do. And I, I've been fortunate. People I was teaching were gonna go do things, anything I was ever. So it's like if somebody, an economics major at Harvard, like wrote a good essay, it was like, oh good, because somebody has to. And I would rather know that they can think a little bit, right? Like, go and do good. So that's the only thing I know how to do. I think it's sometimes we, the tendency to be, uh, or, or feel attacked by someone else's view. And I don't understand that very well. I remember it being in a very book group, and when my friend said, I realized I was having a hard time reading his experience because I felt like I needed to do that in order for it to be, you know, for me to gain from it. And I have not had that experience. I think it's wonderful that people go out and do things, even if I'm not going to do them. Uh, I have a brother who's actually homesteading, and it's awesome. I, I might not be able to do that, but that doesn't threaten. And maybe he's, I mean, not, I don't know if you 
calling privilege or not, he's worked really hard to, to get there. But of course, we're all, all are given. All are given responsibility. I have family who are taking a horse said farm. I don't know who's going to take it over, make it to third generation, but not everyone has that. So the question for me and my brothers is different than for someone else. We're all given something. We're responsible for it. That's our that's our that's our real privilege is to be able to live what we have and the more reality we have the more we Okay, well, maybe we'll just have them come up. And um, let's, let's de-weaponize the word privilege and put it back into the, with the connotation of gratitude, at least here today, you know. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dixie Lane. Uh, Jeff, when you were talking about this new, I think, Khan Academy tutor, I was thinking about my 20 year old brother who is a student at the college where my husband teaches and I occasionally teach. And it's been really eye opening because now I'm seeing a little bit of the student culture that's usually hidden from professors. And when he's lying on the couch in my living room looking at his smartphone, I like to go up and just snatch it from him and scroll in his feeds and see what he's doing. And one of the things I've learned from this is that students at our college communicate largely through meme and through image. They don't use words. So even when they're texting, and I don't know what the students who are here um, may have going on in their student cultures, but they send each other images or little movies and then emojis, and they, they don't use words. Um, I have a concern that if the teacher-student relationship an education happening through relationship is replaced by an AI student relationship like through this tutor, that eventually that relationship will be communicated through things like that, through meme, because it will be about whatever the student wants or is comfortable with, however they can communicate their marketing or whatever it is to the student. What happens if and I think we can already see it in terms of students being less able to do sustained reading or sustained writing. What happens if we get to a point where the younger generation no longer communicates effectively with us through words, and if we can no longer communicate with them through speech or through writing effectively, will just presence be enough as you're saying with Job, to reach those students? Or what do we do if we actually, if this sort of thing leads to that kind of deterioration of communication? Jeff, do you want to take that? You want to come up? I would just say what Cassandra said too about like the, the hollowing out of the middle and that kind of collapse of the mean is what you're talking about, right? Where uh, if you meet students where they're at, then you don't challenge them. And they, where they're at uh, goes lower and lower. So yeah, absolutely. But I do think that um, I mean, I've taught enough to have all kinds of reasons for being depressed, but I've also <laughs> taught enough to have all kinds of reasons for being hopeful, right? And, and when students become kind of hollow, flat people, some of them are content there, but there are plenty of them who become really dissatisfied with that. Mm -hmm. And I think there is an Goodness. incredible hunger right now for alternatives. And some of those alternatives that are on offer aren't that great. But if we can offer them, like here is a different way of being a person. Um, part of that is just who we are in the classroom, who we are, you know, having them into our home, uh, doing festive things with them. Um, then they, their imaginations expand. They think, oh, there are other ways that are possible. And actually, this is a lot more interesting, fun, delightful, joyful. Why do I want these things? So I think so often students just don't have those models in their lives. And I'm not pretending that it's like obviously going to happen if you just be a good person and be present to them, then they want it. No, but there are some. And uh, that is enough to keep going. That real fast. 
Can you guys hear me? Hello, hello. Um, I, uh, two things. What Jeff said, when, when you do have someone hollowed out, we, there is, there's hard work to do, and there's a lot of prayer, and just like hope they're like, okay, we want to awaken a soul. Um, on the other side, uh, especially those of us, I mean, not just parents, I have a single um, uncle who is an amazing mentor. He's a godfather. He's like, he's teaching my kids how to dig up potatoes this past uh, harvest time. He, he is a, he's a great teacher uh, himself, and he's all about introducing reality to others. Um, let's not, let's take it really seriously, especially with young children especially with young children, let's not get, let them get to that point. Let's not let them be hollowed out. And let's take that exceedingly seriously. And let's help other parents do that. There's a, there's a school that I know where a bunch of families like to go there because all the high school parents make a pact that they're not going to give their kids smartphones. That's not something my parents had to think about, but I'm going to think about that. And that's kind of school I would want to be at, so or my, I would want my kids at. So let's 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 do the good work ASAP where we are. Mark, do we have time for one more, or should we? Okay, so sorry, but catch them afterwards.